one of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet that's phenomenal for building muscle, recovery, and athletic performance is red meat. Now, this is probably why a lot of strength athletes eat a lot of red meat. For people like that, I have this piece of advice. If you eat a lot of red meat, uh, like almost daily, go with grass-fed. This is when it makes a huge difference. There is a fatty acid difference between grass-fed meat and conventionally raised meat. Now, it doesn't make a big difference if we eat red meat once or twice a week, but if you eat it more than that, it starts to add up. So if you eat a lot of red meat and you want to take advantage of its muscle building and performance enhancing properties, go with grass-fed. It does make a difference. How, how funny was it when we hung out with Braden that this is one of the requirements to get coached by him. Did you know that's on there too? That you got to eat red meat. Yeah, yeah if you yeah. don't, if you don't eat red meat, then I can't help you. You can't work out at a purple gym. Yeah, <laughs> that's the other one. I love yeah. that. That, that was, was super comical, right? Yeah. But I, this is even this like that. Uh, I, he's like, I saw him post about it just the other day, and he got a lot of heat about it. He goes, wait, let me let me get this straight. So you would prefer I take your money, with, and even though it's an area where I don't think I could help you. Mm. Like, I was like, yeah, that's a good point. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like everybody's so so quick to jump on the whole inclusive train. And it's like, well, you really want me to to do that when I'm admitting that I don't do a good job of helping these types of people out. Mm. Therefore, I'm not the right guy for you. So I'm not yeah. going to take your money. Very logical. Straight. It's too logical. It, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I get it. You know, and he's at the position where he can do that. You know, it's, what's interesting well, is when vegans when, were some of the hardest clients I ever had. Oh, yeah. by far. Oh, Real yeah. hard. By far. You got challenging. In my experience, and I've worked with vegans, uh, in my experience, I had to supplement a lot. Uh, or you have them use a lot of supplements to kind of fill in the gaps. And, and it was very rare where I didn't, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have to do that. You know, I had a lot of vegan clients who came to me and they had symptoms of nutrient deficiencies and issues and we would do testing. And then sure enough, we'd have to supplement. And of those people, this is my personal story with clients, about half of them, uh, the supplements still didn't, didn't do everything. And we had to include um, some animal products. Now, uh, aside from that, just the average population, there was a few things that I did that had profound effects on a person's health. Um, and it was typically when I noticed something in their diet. Like one of them was um, if they ate tons of sugar, cutting that down typically would have a profound effect on behaviors and how they felt and their health uh, that was associated with that. Another one was fiber. I noticed if I got fiber up to a, a decent level, uh, especially if it was digestible fiber, fiber that they reacted well to, I would see like good effects behaviorally. But one of them was red meat. If I had a client that for whatever reason avoided red meat, maybe they they believed in the propaganda of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, red meat's bad for you, or maybe they just, uh, you know, just avoided it for other reasons. When I would include red meat, even if it was a a direct comparison, like let's just replace this chicken with red meat. So you're not eating more, your calories are the same, but let's just go red meat instead of chicken or red meat instead of fish, especially if they already had fish in their diet. They always got stronger. They always felt better. And it's because it's so it's nutrient dense with nutrients. It's yeah. got, um, creatine in it at high levels. Um, and creatine has got athletic performance, uh, effects. It's got high amounts of some of the nutrients that a lot of people, uh, tend to need. Um, especially if they avoid red meat. And and then, of course, with strength athletes, they all eat plenty of red meat. In this case, grass-fed makes a difference because the 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 difference in omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids, the difference in, in CLA, it makes a difference when you eat a lot of red meat. Uh, the, the difference is big enough to where if you eat it, you know, four, five, six days a week, or like I do, seven days a week, I notice a, a, a huge difference in inflammation, performance, health, uh, switching to almost all grass fed versus before what I would do, which was grain fed. I, I just think getting enough protein is to build muscle is a, a challenge for most people, even when you eat meat. And and that, that is one of the most nutrient dense foods that you could possibly eat. It's where uh, the, one of the easiest ways you can get high protein meals. It's uh, also I, for most people would agree. It's a little more palatable than other forms. Right. Of protein, which is, you know, look, if you're trying to eat a gram of protein per pound of body weight, that is actually quite challenging for a lot of people. This is why it's a weight loss strategy, because when you aim for that, your appetite goes down. Um, and I would see this more with women where trying to hit that target, you know, you get a 130 pound female, have her eat 120 grams of protein. They would all come back and be like, this is really hard. Yeah. Like, I can't do this. So then we would look for more palatable sources of protein and red meat just is tastier. Um, yeah. And so it would help. You know, with some of well, that. Well, we've seen the 
I mean, we've seen them try to engineer meats and and try to to get into that market in terms of like the Beyond Meats, and uh, a lot of them are like real oil based sort of like concoctions they've made. What besides like I, I know back back when you know veganism and, and vegetarians were sort of trying to figure this out. It was a lot of like tofu was sort of like the go-to in terms of, yeah. you know, where do I get this sort of substitute? Uh, but in terms of like, where do they, where do they even get and source their protein for like that high of a, a volume? Like how, how do they even approach it? What's yeah. like protein their go-to powder. besides legumes, protein powder? Besides legumes it? and you uh, can't, uh, good luck. Do you know yeah. how much you have to eat? How m- like the quantity and volume of whole natural vegetable sources you yeah. would have to eat? And how get. does that not do they create a lot of gastrointestinal right. stress? That's right. And so that's, I mean, that's, uh, these are just challenges. I remember trying to parse through and I'm like, I just don't, I don't have good answers for you. Yeah. I used to, I would do a vegan day here and there in the past um, because I think it's important to add variety to your diet. Sure. And I would try to do, get a gram of protein per pound of body weight in those days. And I couldn't, it was too much volume and I would get gastro distress. So on those days I would just go low protein and uh, still hit my calorie targets because my carbs were higher and stuff like that. So it doesn't mean it's impossible. I no, mean, there's there's people that that make yeah, it. No, it's just I'm curious though. Uh, but I just in my experience, uh, and I've trained a few people um, that were, and it just that was one of the biggest challenges. Uh, less of a challenge if you were small and trying to lose weight. You know, if you were 130 pounds and you were a tiny petite little thing and you're trying to get down to 115, uh, less of a challenge, but still a challenge. Uh, if definitely though, if you're 150, 180, 200 pounds, and you're trying to build muscle, build your metabolism, like, and trying to hit protein consistently like that, just it's made it really difficult. Yeah. So again, I have, I have a lot of respect for, uh, you know, someone like Braden putting that out there. Like, I mean, I, I wouldn't even have thought, obviously we, we grew up in a different era when I worked in the gym industry. That would have been funny to been, been like that, to tell my, my boss or whatever the place. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry. I don't take any, any vegans. Yeah, <laughs> so it's yeah. more common now. I think too, though, uh, that you see more people trying to go that route, but I, you know, I have one client specifically that I remember. I remember I started training this woman and, um, she had all the symptoms of like nutrient deficiencies and hormone imbalances. And we worked together for a while. Uh, we tried supplementing. So she would supplement with iron, B vitamins, essential amino acids. We added, uh, you know, vegan protein powders. And she got better, but it wasn't like the best. And I remember I connected her to a functional medicine practitioner. We had these long conversations about eating meat. And, you know, she said, well, you know, it's I don't like hurting animals. I said, well, the healthiest version of you is going to be able to do the most good in the world. And you have to, you know, it's like when you have kids, like you don't take care of yourself. You can't take care of your kids. And I said, you're suffering for some, some health issues. Uh, she had anxieties. Uh, her, her, she would notice that she would get depressed. She couldn't get good sleep. And I said, you know, maybe we should try this or whatever. We had a lot long discussions and I valued and respected, uh, you know, how she felt, but she finally said, okay, I'm going to try adding a little bit of animal, sources of, of protein and the functional medicine practitioner recommended grass fed meat said specifically, let's do three ounces a day Mm -hmm. of just some grass fed meat. Let's just start there and see how you feel. And it was like a miracle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Literally like a miracle within weeks. She was like, I feel like a completely different person. And, um, now she never became this huge meat eater, but she would use it. She would eat enough of it to fill in those gaps and it made that big of a difference. But then, the you know, the, the whole grass-fed versus grain-fed debate, I know there's some people out there like, well, it's not a huge difference. It is if you eat a lot of meat. Yeah. If I, you know, I eat red meat daily, and I, you know, thankfully we have a great sponsor like ButcherBox, so they send me a box every month with, and it's all grass-fed. So I would say for me, 70% to 80% of my Red meat consumption is grass fed. Mm-hmm. And I feel a significant difference in inflammation, digestion, health, performance. And it's got to be the, it's the fatty acid profile is what it is because grass fed is just, it's less inflammatory um, fatty acid profile, more omega threes. And, and then the CLA, which by the way, CLA is a fatty acid that uh, if you, if you reduce some fatty acids and replace it with CLA, you'll get fat loss yeah. studies show. In fact, they sold it as a fat loss. Supplement is it a still a popular? It used to be a really popular fat loss. It is, but, uh, you don't add it to your diet and get fat loss. You would reduce one other types of fatty acid and then increase CLA. 
So it's the profile. And then when they, when people do that in studies, they get fat loss. How many, how many and muscle building, how many fat loss supplements like that where we, we like, like uh, pyruvate yeah. lipotropic transport. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. bro. Don't you remember? I guess, I, of course I remember. Yeah, I, I could still even do the spiel for you. It yeah. targets the fatty deposits on your liver, then transports into your bloodstream. So you then use it off as energy. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 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 hey, it's not oh, your fault, bro. We were dude, taught that way. I know, dude. I we just, were, I just, pyruvate's an interesting I think, it, I think that's why it's so important that I think the, the listener understands our history when we, cause I, I don't ever want to come off like we're, you know, like we were perfect. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like we're, we're out here, pre like sure we're, we're preaching to yeah. people like it, we're up on this pedestal. It's like, no. listen, man, I, all these, these, these things that I'm so frustrated yeah. about that I talk about that we see within the fitness space, we were just as guilty of getting sucked into the trap of believing it or doing it too. So I think that's, the, it was the idea of all this was like mm -hmm. come out and expose all that stuff for the average consumer so they don't have to waste their time and money on all that stuff. I mean, does that stuff exist? Is that are those even a popular supplement? Do you know? Like, Doug, look up. Can I get can I get pyruvate can still? Now. Can I get CLA? It, can I get CLA? Yes, they're not as popular because the, they you will know how they work. Sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not why. They will come back. Listen, let me ask you guys a question. Oh, they, oh yeah, they will be recycled it's because you're actually yes. like get recycled trying. with something else. One hundred percent branded. Dude. You guys know, but you guys know this because once there's a little bit of science there to support it, it's enough. That's all you need. What they do is it hits the cycle, gets real popular. Then people say, oh, it's not working. Then it loses its Look steam, at pyruvate still up there too. Of course it is. You know, pyruvate's got health benefits to supplement with. It does have health benefits, maybe some performance benefits. Not a fat, you know, I fat mean, burning is just forget in, that. Yeah, in like a different direction <laughs> yeah. than what they're promoting. Yeah. So well, you, you remember? Do you remember that one? That's like that's re that's released in the Krebs cycle, right? That tells your body then to start to metabolize fat. So by taking the pyruvate, you kicked it, you kickstart it in the in the Krebs cycle. Instead of having to wait the average six to sixteen minutes, the other person does. You take this pyruvate, jumps into that fat burning cycle within like two to three minutes. Feels, <laughs> like, you've done, feels like you've done this pitch before. Multi multiply that by three times a week that you're doing cardio, you get an additional six to sixteen minutes. Of fat loss that the average person would <laughs> by doing this. I feel like multiply that over that months and your, years. Look how, how much fat you burn. <laughs> That's, you must have well, said it's that. crazy. That's twenty years old, dude. That's still in you there. Know, it's burned. Yeah, it's yeah. burned in your memory. In oh, burned. Do you remember how to how to take a, a, a telephone inquiry? I still can remember the list of like the ways you would. Oh, you mean like a call, like oh, someone calling yeah. into, uh, or how to overcome an objection? I mean, this uh, is just. This is why I think, uh, and I know this. I know this for a fact. I'll make this argument all day. <clears throat> People who learn sales in gyms are some of the best salespeople in the world. And I know so many of them that move from the gym. And, you're not going to make tons of money yeah. selling memberships. You're selling a dream. But you learn it's, how to sell effectively. It's the reps that you, you always yes. move to. It's because there's Because then they there's go to no, real estate or whatever. I don't know too many sales cycles that are as fast as the, the gym industry. Yeah, you get a lot of reps. And when you learn effective communication, quote unquote, sales, uh, you realize that it applies to every industry. Yep. It's, you're just, you know, I don't care if it's, you're in software and tech, if you're in cars, if it doesn't matter, it's like all the same rules apply as far as building a relationship, learning to be effective as far as your communication, to pull somebody into a cell instead of push them into a cell. Like, so you can literally take the, I tell you what, that's a, that's a skill that, and I didn't, I obviously I didn't go into it thinking that, like, I didn't go like, oh, I want to be in sales because this could help me with anything, but yeah. boy, having, having those skills I think gave me the confidence that, and I'm sure you guys would agree the same way too. Like once I had gone through that, I was like, dude, I could I, sell anything. I could, yeah, I could go yeah. work anywhere. Like yeah. I really believe that I could go do something. How many people do you guys know? Cause we all worked in the same, but we all, we also worked in different gyms. How many people you guys know that were excellent at gym sales left, got into real estate or loans yeah, or all, cars or whatever rich and crushed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, And it's, it's exactly that. It's the reps. If you sell gym memberships and big box gyms, especially during the heyday of this, which was like, like nineties, early two thousands, if you did that for a year, that's the equivalent of like seven or eight years in any other industry because of the volume of people that you're trying to sell every single day. You could see 10 people a day. Well, everything, gym. everything that we do is, is arguably a sale, right? Even just basic conversation. So let's take a job that has nothing to do with like commissions and sales. You still have to, no, still sell, you have to sell your ideas yeah. to your peers, to your bosses, to your employees. And so those those skill sets transfer into anything that you do. I mean, it's such a it's, it's a, all communication. Yeah, it's something that I think that we we should have been uh, taught at a very young age. And it's uh, I mean, an effective communication. I think more more people understood how to do that. You less people would be fighting and bickering, and it would be it would be better for everybody. To have effective that skill. communication is actually can be reworded as effective listening. 
Swear to God. Yeah. If you know how to listen properly, then you'll know how to communicate sure. effectively. And that's what you learn doing it, you know, 10, 15 times a day for years. It's like, oh, I got to listen better so I can communicate. Well, better. you want to know what's not effective is putting your money in SVB. <laughs> <laughs> that's not effective at hey, all. Right? <laughs> hey, that's wild. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, it's getting crazy. So there's a couple, like we got to talk about this because you told me a statistic that I was not aware of. That SVB, so Silicon Valley Bank, this is like a 40-year-old institution here in the Bay Area. They fund a lot of startups and, you know, uh, they're, they're like instrumental, okay, in this area. Yeah. They, what did you say? Over 90% of their So depositors- most banks, most banks, they're the inverse of most banks. So most banks, the average depositor, okay, so like- Wells Fargo, Bank of America. Yeah, 75 to 80% of the people that have their money in those banks are are already fully insured by FDIC anyways, because most people don't have over a quarter million dollars in their bank account. And the people that do, it's less than 10%. So majority of the people are everyday regular people. Yeah, everyday regular people that are in a Bank of America, Wells Fargo would fall in that category. doesn't mean there's a a small percentage of people that are millionaires that have lots of money in there, but most people have uh, only 250 or less, and so they're fully insured and they're, uh, they're safe. 90% 90% of the, the people are like that in these normal banks. At this bank, it's a, the inverse. So only, t- let, and it's actually what I, the, what I heard was, was north of 90% of the people in there are multimillionaires that have more than 250,000. So more than more than 90% of those not insured. are not insured because of that. Which is crazy, yes, and, and then you think about the quickness which uh, you know the federal government went. Yeah, in so there why bring that up? Everybody. Well, you bring we bring that up because there is this. Okay, what what happens in a situation like this? Do we bail them out? Do we not bail them out? Okay, I think the consensus is to to protect the depositors because if you didn't, the frenzy this could potentially cause to everybody, including myself. I mean, Doug and I were in the middle of moving ba- money to another bank account. It scared us enough to freaking freeze and stop everything like that because who knows? It's not a major Bank of America, Wells Fargo bank that we were moving into. We were going to get a better interest rate. Yeah. So we completely halted that because of this situation. So imagine if this bank completely collapsed and then another one collapses and then all of a sudden everybody starts pulling their money and then we have oh, a yeah, massive crisis on yeah, our hands. Yeah. So, so, I, so this is one of those situations where I can totally see both sides. So mm-hmm. there's that side. Here's the other side. The other side is our policies of bailing out banks has created incentives. Yes, it's created incentives uh, and a culture around risky lending and and policies within these banks that causes these problems, that causes these balance sheets, that puts them in situations where they're screwed. So it's it's like if it's like imagine this: you get you have ten thousand dollars, you're going to go to Vegas. And if you lose it all, they'll give you back that $10,000. Well, you're going to gamble every single dollar. Mm-hmm. And so what's happened in the banking and the financial industry is that they don't have risk. They've already been shown that if they screw up, that the government's, the taxpayers are going to come in and bail them out. And so there's no, there's no incentive for them to be very careful to weigh the risks. The incentive is actually the opposite. And when it comes to insuring these people, we, we, I, I believe there could be, and here's the other the argument that I'm going with. I believe there could be a market-based um, insurance where if there wasn't government guarantee for, let's say if the FDIC didn't, didn't exist, I believe there would be a market-based insurance where you would go to a bank, you deposit your money, and then they would say, would you like to pay for insurance if something happens? Mm. And then it's up to you. Instead, we have government-backed, which is taxpayer-backed, and so this creates this system where we're going to keep seeing this happen. We're going to continue to see, because after 2008, they passed all these regulations. This will never happen again. Well, shit, it looks like yeah. it's starting to happen again. What's going on? You know, with the, with the Well, to be fair to that point, we're actually not bailing the investors and the bank out. We're bailing the depositor yeah, out. Yeah, but which you is said a better that statistic. Situation. I know. Which makes it sound like it's the same- uh, Same people. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They're all investors. These I are mean, donors. I mean, These are huge political donors. Yeah. They're I mean, they're, they're obviously they're definitely in there, right? But yeah. there, there's got to be some people that are. I mean, there's a, there's a percentage for sure that are your your you know smaller startups. Because look what happened to in 2008. We had this huge financial collapse, and we had a lot of it had to do with home loans. I remember getting a home loan right around that time. This is what it was like. You'd go to the bank, and the bank would say, oh God, "State was, your income." Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, why were banks doing this? If banks held, if they held the, the the keys, if they held the the risk, no way in hell they would do that. They would say, "Uh-uh, 
Prove to us you can pay us back. Here's your rate. Sorry, you don't qualify. But we had all these government policies come in and said, no, you got to guarantee loans and home ownership is a right in America. And, oh, it's discriminatory if you don't give these people a loan over here, regardless of what, whatever. And, oh, by, and, and by the way, so here's your, here's your regular, here's your policies. Oh, and by the way, if, if you lose, don't worry, we'll come in mm-hmm. and we'll give you that money. And so you had this crazy system of loans where you had all these people that Which, should not have had loans. By the way, I told you this, and <laughs> this is yet to come. This is coming. Okay. We did the same thing in the last three, three to five years in the car market. Yeah. Dude. Hence mm-hmm. why we saw this rapid, like, I mean, it's like head scratching. How did we get to the average car payment in the United States at $700? Well, that's why. Yeah. Because you gave it to a lot of, you gave loans to people that shouldn't even have it in the first place. It's, and so they have this attitude of like, forget ah, it. Fuck it. Why I'll, not? I'll name another industry where this is very clear. Look at student loans. Student loans, government comes in and says, everybody deserves higher education. We got to make money easier to give to people because they need to go. And what's happened is the cost of higher education has exploded because of these guarantees. Instead, if we allowed it to be a market response, then you would have colleges that are like, hey, look, uh, you know, we're going to cater to these people over here because they don't have the money, but the, but the, the demand is still there. And these expensive colleges, a lot of them wouldn't exist because money wouldn't be so easy. So all we've done is inflated and bloated the cost. You have colleges. I know I've toured some of these colleges. I got a kid going to college. Yeah. I walk around these campuses. It's a freaking resort. Why are they, why do they have a resort here? Well, because they're all fighting for a lot of money, a lot of easy money. You got students getting hundred thousand dollar loans mm. to go to school, have no business paying it back, getting art history degrees or whatever. It doesn't make any sense. Did you guys see how like the right is sort of spinning this now in terms of oh, being SVP? a wedge issue for, oh my because God. it's, uh, there was, I guess there was like the, the person in charge of the financial uh, manager of the SVB was like put on her bio, like she was queer and super and woke, super woke, like all in it, which literally has nothing to do with no. like, the crisis this, that's going this is on. the political spin now yeah. of the right. Oh, they went woke, that's why they went broke. Shut no, up, that's is that right. really the yes, yeah, so that's 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 that the Fox running talking is, points right yes. now? <laughs> is a woke uh, issue. No, the, it's not, dude. Uh, hilarious. I, I get uh, it when politics you, just yeah. can't help themselves. Their banking was not that, uh, not that. Yeah. yeah, that's not why they're, they went to crash. I get it when you're trying to sell a product and you try and put something down someone's throat. That's nothing to do with that. That's nothing to do with that. But they found a nice spin didn't they yeah yeah they <laughs> i tell you what i it's a, it's amazing Enable. to me how many how many people still watch fox and cnn both they're just such trash dude yeah, yeah. such it, trash it's, it's uh it's it's you it's know all what propaganda garbage the only thing you could do is this is what i do and it's really hard to do is to watch both and then try to poke <laughs> holes in both and then you it, typically will find like i used to something make something in the middle my buddy yeah. and i we used to make fun of our other friend who used to say he gets all his news from twitter but i'm starting to believe that that's a better source of information well, these days now yeah uh, did you hear the fbi came out i think it was fbi oh, yeah yeah 80%. so I, I sent an article yeah that literally and i and i heard i think it was even on a podcast i heard this too that they brought it up and i, I started looking into it there's multiple articles now of like a ex uh cia fbi like you know deep state uh, was actually looking into this and f- like reported that it, it's not just a, a small amount. It's of upwards of like 80, over 80% uh, bots that were uh, responsible for the numbers for Twitter and said that that's not just Twitter. It's like across all social media platforms. Yes. And so think about that in terms of like programming and, and how this is shaping society. And it's like a complete facade, completely artificial. And, uh, you know, it, in terms of people and like how we're just susceptible to this group think and what they can do with that uh, kind of power they've created. Well, if they prove this, if they prove that it's 80 percent, Elon has a case, doesn't he? Doesn't he have the ability to go back and come after yeah. him? Because that was part of the deal. Yeah, like they, they basically sold him a lie or whatever. Yeah. The value was... Yeah, you know what's interesting about this is since social media became so popular, I don't think anybody can argue that uh, politics has become more extreme. Mm -hmm. And when they do studies on this, what they find is, you know what the difference is? Is not that people are more uh, extreme in their views necessarily, but that they hate the other side more. That's what's happened. Yeah. 
Yeah. What's happened is the other side has become more hated yeah. by the side. That well, that's on. because they do a good job of what we just highlighted with the Fox News is taking something that's completely irrelevant, has nothing to do with this situation, and then finding a way to tying it to a side, you know, right. like, ah, oh, the left, it's because she's woke. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This, yeah. this bank is going under. It's like, come on, dude, it has nothing to do yeah. with that, right? But with social media, if it's all bots, think about, um, you know, where those bots come from. Yes. And it's an easy psyop for other countries to yeah. psychologically- Foreign actors yeah. or deep state. Like, it, it, that's the thing. It's like one or the other, it's both colluding against, you know, the, the general population. Yeah. Now, you ask yourself why these companies- don't fix it because it's the not in their best interest. Yeah. The Why incentives for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter is to look like you have more followers, to look like you have more engagement, to look like there's sure. more people stocks, more valuable. Cause you, it, you know, if you get, if you have 50,000 followers on your Instagram, like you feel like this is valuable. I got to be here or whatever, even though, you know, only 10,000 are. Well, real. it trickles all the way down to even somebody like us. When we do business with another partnership, this is the stuff that these companies always want to see. Yeah. Oh, what's your total reach on social media? What yep. are your downloads? Your engagement, also, you know, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, well, I guess what the future will be. I mean, I imagine somebody will eventually create software that, so I, I could see this happening in the future. It's definitely like, and what will happen, the, the market will take care of this is because the people that get screwed are these companies, like let's say that invest with someone like us that go like, oh, these guys are huge. We're going to spend, you know, half a million dollars on advertising with them there. Come to find out, you know, 80% of our followers are not real or not. They're just all mm -hmm. bots. Like, there's got to be somebody who's going to create some sort of software or filter that you run all these things through. And it's like, and then when, when I make the claim, oh, we've got, you know, 10 million people that are listening to us a month, they go like, oh, well, according to our stats, when we ran through our filter process, you actually only have 2 million. It's got to be engagement. Yeah, it's got to be something like there's that. There's got to be something because you know how many people I, I, I know on Instagram that, or, that we're friends with and I go on, I see their posts and I'll go read the comments and 80% of the comments are spam or crap or not real. And then the the likes and the comments to the amount of people that follow them doesn't make sense. You know, like these, these pages with yeah, a million what followers. The, what, what, you're, what you're highlighting, because we've seen this happen. On, I mean, every day I, I block somebody who's spam who comes on our, mm -hmm. our stuff now. Yeah. I think that what's unfair about that, you know, example is that when you get to a certain size, and I, I think I really noticed it on the Mind Pump Media page when we started getting you to get like targeted. 200. Yeah, you get targeted. Yeah. But that just highlights the bot thing because there's also yeah. sophisticated bots that don't, you can't tell. They're not spamming. It looks like they're putting a genuine comment. I've had a bunch of them on Twitter. I'll go to their pages and I'll be like, oh, you joined last month. Yeah. And, you, and you have, you, know, you follow, you know, you follow one nobody person. Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just me. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. a talking point. I've had people comment. This has happened to me too. I'll have people comment under a post and it's the exact same comment. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, oh, you guys were directed here by the same algorithm. Or oh, really? Exact same verbatim comment or whatever. And it's two different people. So that's, it's all weird. But 80% is crazy. That's a, so you, you guys think, think there's a social media bubble that's about to pop? Insane. No. Still, I think it's still. I doesn't, hope for that, but I don't think so. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Because yeah. I mean, all this, the other stuff is still true. You know, you can, I think all it does is I think it gets better if hopefully in the future for people like us to have a better understanding. I mean, one yeah. of the most frustrating things about this business, I tell you what, like it gives me headaches every day is trying to read all this data that is, is inaccurate Yeah, and get it a, a, like, are, yeah. are what we doing is, is what we're doing good? Cause I can't tell cause the downloads are here, then they're there. And then it's like, Oh, then the followers are here. <coughs> then the subscribers are there. It's like, it's always There's moving no transparency at all. Yeah. <coughs> and, and, and it doesn't seem to make sense. And wow. so, and, and it's like I, reading chicken bones. It, it's so weird. Yeah. It's, they've done such a fantastic job because like, I mean, I'm still talking to people that are like mad at, at Elon and I'm like, what, what are you actually mad about? And literally, it's like exposing, they're mad at exposing, saying this is all like disinformation and all this, stuff, even though he's exposing what literally was in the files. Like, I, to me, it's just, it's mind blowing, like how conditioned people oh. have gotten from this. I know, that's crazy. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway maps 15 minutes. This is a 15 minute everyday workout program that produces phenomenal strength and muscle building results. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we pick you as the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section that you got free access to Maps 15 Minutes. Now, everyone else, we have a promotion going on right now. We put together a brand new workout program bundle called the Time Crunch Bundle. This bundle includes Maps 15 Minutes, Maps Anywhere, Maps Prime, and the uh, ebook Eat for Performance 
what we did is we put them together in this bundle, discounted it over $200 off. So the total price for all that is $99.99. So it's a, it's a great, great deal. If you're interested, it's only happening this month. So go to mapsmarch.com or just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. All right, so um, I yesterday I was having this conversation with my youngest and I'm telling, he likes me to tell stories. So I'm telling him stories about the time his grandfather did this and that. And he's not fully, like he doesn't really understand 100%, but he still likes these, these types of stories. All of them make me look like a superhero, by the way. I might be distorting his view a little bit, but whatever. He's only two. Yeah. But we're having these conversations. And then I remember the story of my dad when he was younger. And I've told this story before on the podcast. This is this is true. He was he was 17 and he had a, a car pinned his sister and he like lifted the car and flipped it. And my dad says he was all hurt afterwards. And then I remember, and then that rem reminded me of stories of things that I've done in my life under extreme stress where I didn't, I couldn't believe what I did. Like I told you guys, I jumped from the bottom of the stairs to the top to catch my son. And uh, it led me down this rabbit hole of looking up the limiters that we have on our actual physical performance and capacity. I mean, you guys have all heard stories of the mom yeah. saving your kid from the burning car or somebody. So I actually found some pretty cool studies on this. I'll read to you uh, some of the stuff that I read the here. So complex. It's that. really interesting. Like our brains total, it's literally like a speed limiter on your car. Mm -hmm. You have a car that has the potential to go 150 miles an hour, yeah. but the speed limiter makes you hit 110 and then that's it. You don't go any faster. And your brain has this as well. What's cool though, is you can actually train your speed limiter you to allow, it. yeah, to allow your body to produce more force through training and practice. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a study that was published in the Journal of Neuroscience in 2015. The title was The Neural Control of Maximum Voluntary Force Production. And it aimed to investigate how the brain controls the amount of force the body can generate during a maximum grip force task. They used fMRI to measure brain activity while participants were asked to squeeze a device with as much force as possible. They found that the brain's motor cortex and other areas involved in controlling movement became more active as participants exerted more force, suggesting that the brain plays a critical role in determining the amount of force the body can generate. Then there was another one in the Journal of Experimental Biology in 2017. The title was Neural and Muscular Factors Limit Maximum Voluntary Force Production in Humans. And same thing. And they found that using surface, uh, what's called SEMG, measured the electrical activity of the muscles of the leg during maximal contractions. They found that the muscles were capable of generating far more force that was actually produced. So the brain literally limits muscle activation and the, the widely accepted belief is to prevent injury. Yeah. So your it's brain is like- overbearing mother analogy. Yes. So yeah. it's like your brain is like, eh, we're going to let you produce this much force because any more than that, we believe you're going to hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to lift this much weight but uh, we're going to stop you at lifting well, this I, much weight. I don't know what the number, maybe you remember this, but I, what I find really fascinating is the gap between the average lifter in person to like the Olympic lifter. Yes. Like the, the oh, it's, it's something like 60 to yeah, 70%. Yeah. I think it's like six, 50 to 60 for the and average person. Olympic lifters are north of 90. Yeah. So they're able to generate. So yes, they have stronger muscles, bigger muscles, but the real uh, secret to their power is the fact that they're able to move that rev limiter or that, that speed limiter way up. Well, and it speaks a lot to frequency, right? The more you expose yourself to this like particular movement, the more um, chance that, that you're overriding that system that this is safe, this is effective. Like we can, we're allowed to produce more force yes. within this specific environmental setting. And this is also the case for stability uh, training. If your body feels like it cannot be stable at producing a particular type of force, it will limit the amount of force you produce. Substantially, so the yeah. arguments against stability training by strength athletes is silly uh, because advanced strength athletes are good are great at producing stability within their lifts through practice and frequency and years and years of training, and they 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 kind of downplay this for the average person. But a lot of the average person's strength limits are coming from their brain because their yeah. brain is perceiving instability. Yeah. In fact, knee sleeves. All over the place. Knee sleeves. A knee sleeve is not the same as knee wraps. Okay, so knee wraps are tight and they actually do provide a little bit of stability. A knee sleeve is, is, is at most, is providing a tiny bit of stability, but not really. But what it does is it tricks the brain mm -hmm. and it makes the brain think your knee is more stable and then you can yeah. lift 
more weight. Believe me, those knee sleeves cannot lift 10 pounds. Well, I remember making this case way back when we first started this show and I was wearing the compression pants when I would do leg day. Correct. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I could just, yes. I, I felt yeah. external feedback. Yeah, that's that's right. And I know, I know these little thin pieces of nylon wasn't making me stronger, but I felt stronger. I felt more stable in my, in my, when I was squatting and deadlifting. So I wear, loved to wear it. Wear a compression shirt, long sleeve, mm -hmm. go do an upper body workout and you'll feel stronger. Because your brain is tricked into thinking well, yeah, you're more stable. And it's interesting. I've, you know, I've definitely shit on the, the leggings thing, you know, just for, for men in general. <laughs> just because you I'm can't just wear not them. a fan. <laughs> <I just laughs> your legs are too like, big. You know, see a dude deadlifting and, you know, what, what that entails. Uh, but in terms of recovery, too, like there's there's valid study that shows, too, that you get, you know, uh, a lot more recovery just wearing that compression to, to help with the, the fluid. Yeah. And it's uh, also, this is also why, um, what's it called? Can it Kin tape or the where the tape where they yeah. tape is that what it's called? Kinesio tape. Yes, it's like when I first saw that I'm like that's not creating any stability. It's like tape to your skin. No, no, no. It's literally changing recruitment patterns and telling the CNS to fire in a particular. So if you know how to use a tape properly, yeah. you're literally telling the body through you know that feedback that you outside can feedback. kind of prioritize one muscle versus that's the right. other. But what's the point of this? The point of this is part a big part, not a small part, a big part of your training when you do strength training is brain training and yeah. central nervous system training, not muscle training. And the better and more efficient and more effective your central nervous system is at firing uh, muscles uniformly or in a way that produces maximal force or whatever, the more your muscles have capacity to grow. You can't ignore one or the other. They both work together. So You, you know, the irony of this conversation is that this is obvious and been known forever in, in the rehab field. Like if you go yeah. like physical therapy and so that like, that's why you do all that totally. stuff. It's crazy that it took this long for like the strength community and muscle building community. Same rules apply in a high performance. It, yeah, exact same rules apply. It's just like, so it's, it's interesting that we've had this information. We've known about it. We've been applying it to our patients in physical therapy for, you know, decades now, yet it's barely kind of making its way into, you know, sports performance. Stuff. But I mean, you can even tell by like, look how much the NBA NFL has adopted to like the, all the compression yeah. pants and sleeves and things like that. Like it's right. Katrina, and I were literally just talking yeah. about this. Actually, we were watching the game the other night and she's like, man, she's like, it's rare to actually see an NBA player's arms or legs anymore. Well, because they all wear the, the full. Compression Isn't compression that interesting though, too? Because it, I mean, there's that whole conundrum as a coach. Because like, do you take the time to to uh, fix and correct, you know, muscle recruitment patterns that they've literally solidified uh, to get to the point where they're at like an elite level? No, at that point, it's too at late. that point, now you just got to patch the holes, yeah. right? And so this is like your best bet is to like have the sleeves and have all the external feedback to keep you in a stable, a stable kind of yeah. uh, setting. Yeah, I'd be like trying to correct LeBron James's feet. I've never seen pictures of his bare foot. It looks all weird because his feet yeah. are massive. Probably wore two small shoes. You fix that, the guy's basketball game is going to totally change. He's yeah, I never learned how to play. I, I mean, I've never played. I would love to now, like play <sighs> with compression pants. I never did. Like that was something that I later adopted in lifting to get strong. But I'd already stopped playing basketball. Like I'd never played ball with compression stuff on, which I can imagine, especially something like that where you're so dynamic. Yep. And you're moving in different planes. Like I, I would think that that feeling probably with having those compression pants on when I'm playing on the court would probably make me feel a lot better. You know what? This also, because it's there's somewhat of a mystery, I will acknowledge this. It's somewhat of a mystery as to why exercises like barbell squats or deadlifts, overhead presses, or free weights in general compared to machines, why free weights are still favored by a majority of strength athletes, people who are trying to build muscle, uh, coaches who've worked with people for a long time. You just see better results. And when we get down and try to argue it, it's hard to kind of argue what's going on because the, the studies that we have don't necessarily point to one being superior. We have studies that'll that'll kind of uh, allude to that, but I but in in real world practice, it just it's just true. I think it has to do with the central nervous system training that free weights provides because it's free, requires more stability. It 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 tells your body uh, how to be safe in a kind of free environment better. And I think it teaches the CNS to fire more effectively. That's mm -hmm. why I think the deadlift and the squat just tend to build more strength and muscle than, than machine versions of those lifts ever will. And I've seen this again. I mean, again, if you train anybody or lots of people, I should say for two decades, you just know this, you just yeah. know this to be true. And I think it has to do with that. And I, I'd, it's, it's hard to construct a study to figure that out, 
But I mean, I, at yeah, at for some sure, point that's they will. one of that's part of it. I think, factor, I think that's yeah. I think that's part of it. Maybe I think that's a big it. factor to be yeah. honest with you. No, yeah. Anyway, I've been following this page on uh, Facebook, uh, like vintage lift. Not a page, sorry, it's a group. This is a hack, by the way. I've oh, talked about this before. Talk about your anti gravity group. No, you just, oh, bro, that's another one. That's so good. For us, Dude. Like, so I, uh, on Facebook, an anti gravity I, I love group. Sal has like real nerdy uh, groups that he's There's following. There's this anti gravity, too, anti -gravity so group that I, that I showed Justin. What? Yeah. <laughs> they post evidence of like anti gravity devices in in the ancient world. It's all like conspiracy theory type. Isn't stuff. that part of the the <laughs> what, isn't that part of the conspiracy theory around the pyramids? Is that what they think? Yeah. Is that one of the things? There's some weird stuff with yeah. that. You know they have evidence of like advanced tools that were being used they can't explain. Like mm -hmm. perfect holes. Well, yeah, because the aren't the cubes the like perfect. perfect precision or whatever like that? Like the you couldn't even fit like yeah, a piece of paper. The, the between. surface of some of these uh, stones is is like it's like polished. It's yeah. so so flat and like they can't even believe like that they had machines back then that could produce yeah something like without that. electricity yeah. or whatever. And anyway, so, so there's, there's another group I go on that's uh it's vintage it's like vintage lifting or something like that, and uh, it's so cool. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but you guys know that Marilyn Monroe was an active uh, strength training. She did lots of strength training. Really? A lot of people don't know that. I didn't know. Yeah, that. she was taught by Jack Lane and, and bodybuilders at the time. And there's lots of pictures of her doing barbell squats and presses Interesting. and rows. Uh, it, which, she kind of had that like hourglass kind of figure. Yeah. It was like, you know, not... Definitely wasn't like the, the, the skinny kind of like promotion after that. It was like still when... It's just, you know, it's just women didn't lift. Body. I mean, come on, women didn't start lifting weights. I want to see, pull up later. a picture of her. Dog. I want to see, because I mean, I I'll can, send it to obviously Doug. I can picture her. She but looked I'll, great, obviously. No, no, yeah. I, I have a picture. I'll send it to, to Doug right now to show you guys. Oh, wow. Uh, because, uh, oh yeah, look, look at all those pictures of her lifting weights. Overhead presses and squats and. And then, of course, those weird 50s exercises where they have their legs up in the air. Doing, I don't know what they're <laughs> you know, doing. It's the one that, like, you know what's, you. what's interesting to me about this is actually how this didn't get more popular. Right? The fact that, one, I didn't even know about this. And someone that was so, right. you know, popular in her time. I mean, like, labeled as one of the sexiest women of all time. Uh -huh. That you would have thought that that would have actually yeah, sparked a whole trend, right? Like, yes. Because, I mean, look what the Kardashians have done. It just exactly dumb, like... Um, the, what are they the skims, trainers skims and things. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is, like they're creating trends all over the place. Do you see that? Okay, so at the top, that picture of her dumbbell chest pressing on the bench right there. Yeah. So I had that blown up and put up in my wellness studio. Really? I, I, because, I, you know, I, I, you know, this. remember, I opened my wellness studio a long time ago and I, I was constantly trying to sell women that they need to lift weights. And I thought, what better... Then a Marilyn. picture of Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, no, no. Doing a chest press. On. Doug, yeah, maybe you can look great. up She's who, like healthy who trained her, who taught her. I'm pretty sure she learned from Jack Elaine, uh, but I, I want to make I sure. I mean, who else could have? Who was around around that time that was that. coaching or teaching people? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Especially at the celebrity status? Yeah, put Marilyn Monroe strength training and see. But anyway, pretty cool, right? So I, I was going on there and looking. Hmm. And they have pictures of all these, you know, bodybuilders and strength athletes from, you know, back in the day. So it's. You know, pretty cool stuff. And it's funny. I was sending, I was, I was in a, in a group thread with, I have this group thread with my cousins and buddies and stuff. And every time I send them like a picture or video of some strength athlete or whatever, they always say the same thing. Steroids. Tons of steroids. <laughs> I'm like, you know, dude, <laughs> I made this argument. It's just like this big button. Steroids. Yeah, yeah. So here's the way it looks better. Out, here's the, out of shape people always want to point to that. It's like the easiest, it's the easiest ways to justify why you're not in shape. Well, I try yeah. to explain them genetics. And then I use this example. Imagine, I'll ask you guys this. Imagine if brain steroids existed for the last 50 years. How imagine how we would explain people like Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. Elon Musk, oh, yeah. uh, you know, Stephen Hawking. They would get blamed on taking brain steroids, right? Yeah. That's how dramatic the genetics are for intelligence. We accept it. The same exists for muscle building. There are people, you know, you look at Michael Hearn when he was 16 or or Lee Priest when he was 16. Like they're mutants. They're just on another. So I was trying to explain that. And by them. the way, it doesn't, yeah. it, it, and it doesn't discredit them of where they're at. Cause it's a, it's the combination of that, that makes them these icons. Yeah. You know, the, what makes Michael Hearn so unbelievably special is that not only is he a rare person that has that genetics, but then he, he also in the put in the work for decades and decades to, to, to be that guy. Right. Yeah. That's otherwise he would just be like, if he didn't care about working out, he'd just be a pretty fit looking average guy who doesn't work out, but he looks fit because he has those great genetics. Yeah. Right. Like, and we've seen those, I've seen people like that before who 
don't even really train and stuff like that, but have a very aesthetic physique. They're well balanced. They have they have muscle, but they don't really train. And that's an and you see. I mean, I remember seeing people like that as a trainer, going like, "Man, yeah. boy, if you, if I just got a hold of you, frustrating. You're like, oh man, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember, potential. Remember when we were creating Map Strong uh, with uh, Oberus? Uh, yeah, Robert Oberus. He's a strong man, right? Three hundred. Yeah. What was he? Three hundred forty pound. Just just Something giant. Like that. Yeah. And there's a section East. for people who don't have Map Strong. There's a section in there. Where you speed could do like, ladder. yeah, you could do like extra, like you know, cool work or whatever. Yeah. And he does speed ladder and, and sprints in there. And he was in here filming it. And when I saw him do the speed ladder at 340 pounds, I, he I was mean, like defying the laws of physics. It was actually terrifying. That's, yeah. that's the answer. That's the question. Well, that, and then also, I don't know if you were there when he was doing pull-ups. Yeah, I was like, like looking at a guy that big, just, rah, rah, yeah, just uh, unbelievable. Yeah. I was like, yeah. that's terrifying. When you see a guy that big, move on his feet as fast as he did and sprint. And you see someone run that fast. That that's, that, that's that. Do big. you remember when we that's interviewed, scary. um, yeah. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Um, when we interviewed the guy who does the sports science show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the most yeah. like, like aha, aha moments I had with like some of these athletes like that was watching that show when they did, I want to believe it was, uh, um, uh, Nadamakan Sue from well he was in the line he was with the lions then and then he was with the bucks and then i think rams i don't know where he's at now um but he was he, they did that whole thing where they would they would do something where he comes off the line and he hits like a dummy or whatever but they had all these sensors to like oh, and the, like the, his the force impact yes like hit. the force impact of his arm like yeah. coming across was like a, like a car accident <laughs> at like 70 miles an hour yes that like sucks. i remember my head yeah. like exploding going like whoa like, yes. a like i don't i know you have a helmet on and pads on the other side but imagine getting hit by a car by a human like by their arm just it was wild I felt like a, a fraction of that before you know like I, I can only imagine what nfl like that felt like oh, when you because, play college yeah because even just playing like on the d1 level like you get like so that's whatever percentage um you know the rest of the average type of of player versus like your elite you know one percenter it, it was like it, it was it was like a, it was like a get hit by a truck like a literal truck that would just steamroll you and you had to deal with it and so you had to figure out like <laughs> angles and leverage and ways you could get their knees and Oh my God. Dude. Yeah. I, I don't know imagine. what Sue weighs, but he's probably 250, 280 range. You're, so you're talking about a bit and the, the speed, but just the power, the speed, yeah. Agility, the power, explosivity is yeah. How insane. agile they are. I mean, it's just what, wild what to that see, say, see that person. <clears throat> so she didn't have a personal trainer and she evolved her own exercises. And she said for the muscles, I wish to keep firm. And I know they are right for me because I can feel them putting the proper muscles into play as I exercise. She, got taught. she didn't just learn. What are you going to learn? I don't know. 1950s. I don't work out without. Yeah, no way. That's sexist. So. Yeah, no, that's not said anybody. <laughs> ah, she was a celebrity. This for you, real quick. She was a celebrity. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? She, I guarantee she had access to. Uh, to but anyway, pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of athletes, another reason why we see performance, uh, like records being broken and stuff, is they just learn different techniques. They learn different ways of doing certain things. Here's a great example. It, up until 1968 the high jump was performed a particular way in the Olympics. You ever watch videos? Oh, yeah, of yeah. The high? used to go like over. forward. Yeah, they would do, of they'd behind, kick their backwards. leg over and kind of do like these, these like, like this high jump over it, right? Yeah. And then in 1968, uh, Dick Fosbury decided he would jump backward, which is so not, like that. that's not obvious, right? You want to jump backwards over this thing? Yeah. And he broke records. And from then on, that's how the way, that's how people, now when you see a high jump, nobody jumps foot forward. They jump head forward because of the technique allows for a higher jump. You remind me of all these old episodes that we did. Reverse. Remember when we talked about the <laughs> TED Talk on the sports science one? That was another one of those ones that blew my mind. Because I, again, I would have attributed the, the the gains that we've seen in athletes to steroids yeah. and nutrition, the sport. And it, it's all the other stuff. Like, so all the uh, the shoes and the gear and the things that the we track. use. Yeah, the swimming pool, how now it has like an overflow thing, the swimmer cap, like all these things that we've done to enhance the sport by making these these subtle tweaks have made this, this giant leap in that. Not to mention the, I forget, what's that called when like, 
somebody proves that it can be done and then all of a sudden everybody does it after that like when the i mean the the uh yeah, that's after the one minute mile the four like, minute mile the four minute uh, or the four minute um yeah it was four the yeah. four minute mile yeah it was a four minute mile it did that men, oh, that's, a, men, a, that's there, a mental block yeah there was a point where like like one person had done that and then all of a sudden everybody an, then everybody started doing it and it was like an, on yeah, average high school students yeah now it's in it. the the ethos or whatever yeah now you have high school students that'll actually break this but i mean i always thought i i would if you would have asked me there was a big argument between me and my friends when we were in our 20s about like these, you know, all these athletes are just freak athletes compared to the 50s and the 60s. It's like, oh, that's because of all the drugs, you know, it was the drugs. Watch that Olympic we weightlifting. Out. Watch how they clean and jerked uh, in the 1920s and 30s versus, or clean and press versus today. They almost did like a push press uh, mm -hmm. compared to now where the technique is just so. Paul Anderson did it in, in dress shoes. He was wearing dress yeah. shoes to go out there and press. Uh, and, and it looked kind of like a, it doesn't look like the way they do it now. And he and he did I think four hundred something pounds overhead. Yeah. So um, does it make you wonder though, like like some you would have been capable yeah, of? like these oh. old some of these old athletes that oh yeah, given given different technique and different or gear uh, gear different, yeah, yeah di like different settings, different rules, like you know what they would have done. It'd been there, crazy. There was an Olympic athlete that was uh, God, I can't remember his name. I hate this. He was a, a runner, and he won gold medal. Um, he was so poor. And when he got to the race, he didn't have shoes and he had to wear two different shoes. He had to borrow shoes and somehow he <laughs> wore two different shoes and won mm -hmm. uh, uh, a gold medal. And maybe Doug can, can look up uh, who this was, but it's a true story. They show a picture of him wearing two different shoes. Oh, there he is. Who is that? John. Oh, Jim yeah. Thorpe. Jim Thorpe. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Pretty. There he is right there with his two shoes. <laughs> That's funny. Isn't that wild? That is, yeah. that is I know. It's pretty, it's pretty cool stuff. I mean, do you think we're going to still, I mean, I feel like science, sports science has evolved so much in the last few decades. Yeah. Like, can you, can you, can you. There'll be another evolution. Yeah. I, I, it'd be impossible almost to predict uh, in yeah. terms of like what you would see. Which sport do you think would have the most progression, evolution? Uh, you know, I don't know. Like that's that's an interesting. I thought. feel like what we're in the what we see now more uh, like sport evolution is the 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 rule changing games. Like the no, rule, no, that's a great point. The rule yeah, change to protect the quarterbacks has evolved the NFL. You're completely. right. It's shaping the whole dynamic. The, is, didn't the, didn't right. the where the pitcher, the how the pitcher, how far the pitcher is from the the batter and the mound that changed right uh -huh. over time to kind of change. I don't know game. when that changed, but that's been I think that's been that way for a while. But I mean, you're but along those lines. Yeah, I think what I think the biggest evolution now is like these subtle. I mean, here's a big one. Uh, NBA, NBA cut the shot clock time down, which sped the game up. So there's like all these crazy, yeah. and then there, and then there's certain things that they uh, that you like for we just they just created a new rule in the NBA. So like a a common thing is a guy steals the ball, and then the the, the team that got the ball stolen from them many times will just reach and grab the guy to get a foul to stop the fast break from happening. Mm -hmm. They've now made that a penalty where you now will go shoot a, a free throw. So you get a, if they do that, it's uh, I forget the name of the, what they call it, but it's like a, a clear path foul. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has an opportunity, which and the reason why they the NBA is doing that because it slows the game down. They don't yeah. want the game slowed down. They right. want the excitement of more points and scoring. Yeah, the spectators like that. got to exactly. So they so they make a lot of these rule changes, both NFL, NBA, like it, to make the game more exciting because and so they make it well, easy. In the fight sports, uh, the MMA had to change the rules because uh, the fights would go to the ground and stay on the ground. Oh, so yeah. they had to stand people up and boxing changed fighting boxing gloves and wraps protects the hands fighting for thousands of years how hard your hands were how tough your hands were and how you punched and if you broke your hand determined fights all the time well you wear big gloves and, and wrap your hands now you could throw haymakers and punch different ways yeah. and punch people directly in the head and not have a problem for thousands of years you broke your hand you were dead wasn't there there was a bit of debate with that in terms of mma gloves because they were so small versus like boxing gloves and which ones actually promoted more head injury head trauma no, the, MMA the, the volume of boxing M yeah is way worse yeah. the vibration of the the, the brain slapping against it just well it's just it's you you can hit more that's you right, hit yeah, more. right. you're yeah. constantly getting slapped uh -huh. where you do one time and you, yeah. get, you get laid out like that that's why know? traditional martial arts you see a lot of open palm strikes or chops or whatever and you think why would they do that? It was that research, Justin, that actually saved uh, UFC. So when yeah. UFC first started, it was underground, and they was like, "Oh, there's no way." People were saying, "There's no way this is too yeah, because it's so close bloody to and knuckle. dangerous." Like yeah. so, and people thought it was worse. But then when all the studies started coming out that it was actually safer than traditional boxing, that's by, what made it go. By the way, I just saw this crazy. It was a study that so one of the theories as to why men grow beards and women don't. 
There's lots of theories. Okay. Why do men have beards? <laughs> what's the point? Oh, like, what's the deal? Reminding me of this commercial. Do you know what the, do you know what this, the, what they think it is now? What? It protects the jaw from damage and the head from knockouts because of fighting and conflict. And they did this. They like actually a took fractional percentage. Of actually, the a significant impact? percentage. Really? They took they took skulls and they put short beards, long beards, medium sized beards, and long beards on. And then they dropped uh, heavy device, heavy things on the jaw, on the face, and measured the force. And big beards cut the 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 risk of fracture. Well, that's a no like brainer. Forty percent. There's that's no regulation wild. on that either in terms of like beard length, right? Oh, and I don't know. And I wonder. In fight sports? Yeah. Well, I mean, this just came out. Just watch this. That's like, interesting. Yeah, so it's like, I'd be, it's not like a heat, like Wolfman like 100%, out there. but a big beard. They said, this is why they think men well, beards. Well, okay, so to, you always love the draw back <laughs> to evolution, right? So it'd be interesting if that's like part of where there's an, a, a physical attraction for men that have them, right? Yeah. So there, like, a lot of women like a man with a beard. The, the manly effect. Yeah, it's yeah. like that alpha, like, oh, he definitely, is, his skull has been well, hit that's that, Well, along those lines, this is why a man with a scar on his face is considered more right. attractive right, right. Uh, than a man without a scar on his face. Right. And it's because- scar and a beard, you're getting laid all the time. <laughs> <laughs> scar and a beard, you just... <laughs> Slaying, so slaying everywhere, hey, everywhere you go. Hey, I, I, hey, I want to go back. Early in the episode, we talked about nutrient deficiencies. We have a new sponsor called Haya that makes vitamins for children. We give this to Max. Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah, we give it to Max. So this is important. Children uh, can oftentimes have nutrient deficiencies because they're so picky. Mm-hmm. And when you look at a toddler's diet, for example, it oftentimes is like three foods. Like mm-hmm. this is w- very common with parents. Like, oh, my kid only eats. This, this, and this. And so because of that, they tend to, you, you see nutrient deficiencies in kids because they don't have a wide variety of diet. So this is a multivitamin for kids that is not a freaking gummy bear or a candy. Mm. That's what separates it. It's not this sugary filled candy. It still tastes decent though. Still tasty. Yeah. It's not quite Flintstones or the, the, the gummy, gummy ones yeah. with that, but it tastes good enough that he'll eat it and it's better for yeah, him. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I yeah. hand it to my kids immediately. They're just, hey, yeah. Like, oh, come on, they'd Justin. have to. <laughs> Just like yours don't, dude. Your Terrible kids, dad right? jokes. What did I say? That doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, yeah no, I love it. One hundred percent. Immediately. Who I had got, the shout out? To I got a shout out. Finally, I Jesus. got a great. Welcome to the club. You're welcome, my friend. Welcome. I'm like just Adam can't keep doing the shout outs. <laughs> uh, so um, this person, I think, did I send it to you, Doug? Doctor Becky at Good Inside. There she is. So I, this is the workshop that I talked about on a previous episode that Jessica and I signed up for. She's an expert on raising toddlers and teenagers. She's phenomenal. She's got a 1.7 million followers on Instagram. Phenomenal information. It's been it's been super super effective at getting me to understand my kids and kind of what's going on because they are very different from adults. Um, so good, great page to follow if you're a parent. Very smart stuff, and it's made me much more effective. Is uh, she uh, worthy enough to have as a guest? I am. I already put. Uh, I already put. Uh, the bass signals it. up, I and I'm like, so. get them in here. 100%. Okay. I okay, want this cool. person on the show. Okay. Cool. For sure. Right on. All right, check this out. You're not what you eat, you're what you digest. Now, one of the problems that fitness enthusiasts run into is because we eat a high-protein diet, sometimes we have digestive issues, sometimes we don't fully break down those proteins and utilize those beneficial amino acids. Well, digestive enzymes can help. It can help with bloating, digestion, and they may help you assimilate more of those proteins, fats, and carbohydrates for better performance. There's a company that makes digestive enzymes specifically for fitness enthusiasts. Uh, It's Masszymes. That's why we chose to work with them. Go check them out. Go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump 10 for 10% off any order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first question is from on Huju. When weight training to increase bone density, should I focus more on hypertrophy or strength? Ah, interesting. Very good question. First off, this has to be said. The most effective way to increase bone density is strength training. There's really nothing that comes close uh, to doing this. Aerobic or cardio style training does it a little bit. Exercise in general does it a little bit, but really it's the sheer force on the bone that causes the bone to strengthen. Now, because of that, Sal, is there studies that show like lifting for strength, like heavy, like five by five is uh, results in stronger bones in comparison to hypertrophy training? Is there, it, do, there, what do are, we know? there are no studies, unfortunately. They just show that strength training in general uh, will yeah. do this. Now, my here's my take on it. Hmm. Uh, be, whatever makes your muscle stronger will make your bones stronger. 
And for the average person, it's just going to be appropriate training because let's say, let's say that studies show that heavy strength training is, you know, 3% or 5%, even 5% better than hypertrophy. So then you go, okay, I'm only going to strength train, but then it starts to become inappropriate for you because you overdo it. You don't focus on other things. Body's adapted it's to whatever that. Whatever you can really like sustain. Exactly. You, yeah. you injure yourself or whatever. So I, I, it really is just in the category of anything that builds muscle and strength is going to do this effectively. And the best way for most people to do this through the years is to alternate between cycles of each, uh, which simultaneously is also what produces the best muscle gains anyway. Well, and I've heard, uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Spina that was talking about force being sort of the language of the cells. And so if you look at it in that lens in terms of like how much more force you can produce, like so you could make an argument that maybe like just pure strength training itself would be uh, a bit higher and, and superior in that regard in terms of influencing uh, the type of, of self you know, uh, responsible for producing more bone tissue. Uh, but it, like to your point, I think it's the, the main point is really that you strength training, hypertrophy training, like muscle building in general, uh, the, the one that you can sustain the most and, and, and keep uh, consistent with is the one that's going to be the best for you in your overall situation. Yeah. Yeah. I think the obvious answer is that the, the heavier the load, the more likely you're going to strengthen the bones more than a lighter load. But then, you know, at one point, if you've been doing that for an extended period of time, the body's then adapted to that and the same rules apply, I would think, to the bones as it does the muscles, which is by you phasing it up or changing that a stimulus is only going to continue to strengthen your bones as it would continue to strengthen your muscles. And so, the answer is to continue to strength train, continue to phase your programs out, just as if you were trying to build and yeah, sculpt a body. And also consider this: there's a, there's a, there's risk associated with uh, continuing right. to yeah. So you got to weigh that out, right? So okay, one's a little better than the other, maybe, but um, but then I it hurt myself. Now I can't do anything. By the way, the most effective way to strengthen your bone with a form of resistance training that's the, the least risky and this is evidenced by actual data, is isometric training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I have somebody yep. who I'm just getting started with strength training and they're they're weak, feeble, they, they're they deconditioned because they've never done anything before and they're literally have been sent to me by their, because I've had clients like this, sent to me by their doctor because they're in osteopenia or osteoporosis, I do lots of isometric training right out the gate. Isometric mm -hmm. training are, feels very safe to the body and you can actually produce more force with an isometric type of lift than you can with a conventional strength training lift yep. because uh, you're not moving. So you're actually generating tons of force. So if we had to rank them all, isometrics would be superior when you count risk in. But then again, uh, you miss out on the benefits of full range of motion training, all that stuff. So really it's about what's appropriate for you. The appropriate type of strength training is going to give you the best results, uh, especially when you consider the, the context of long term. Next question is from Fit Right by Matt. Which form of training better promotes metabolic health? Resistance training or high intensity interval training? Oh, I like this. Yeah. So in the short term, well, first, first explain metabolic health. Yeah, metabolic health would be your how your body responds to glucose, you know, blood sugar levels. Uh, the function of the mitochondria, how, you're, how insulin sensitive you are. In short, a faster metabolism. Yeah, just or, yeah, or just uh, metabolism that's effective, efficient, that's sensitive to, to, to insulin, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so high-intensity interval training in the short term is super effective. The problem is in the long term, it kind of, it still works, but it's not nearly as powerful as simply having more muscle. Muscle is uh, directly connected to metabolic health. Muscle is very insulin sensitive. Uh, it's an insulin sensitive tissue. Muscle is also where your body will store some glycogen or glucose. So um, the liver is the main place, but skeletal muscle is another place. If you have more muscle, it's like having a bigger um, tank to store the sugar that you consume um, and working out your muscles, training your muscles um, improves mitochondrial health. So just building strength in muscle long-term is the most effective strategy for metabolic health by far. And they have studies on severely obese people. They have them losing their weight. They just haven't built a little bit of muscle. And we see significant improvements in me metabolic health, more so than just having them I I, lose I don't even think this is a close conversation. Yes. <laughs> I actually think that- Pretty one-sided. I think in a, in a short study, it might look close. 
in a very short right. six week study, it might look somewhat close, but still I would think resistance training will still outperform it. You want to talk about a year, two years though, it, it will blow it away. Well, it the won't reason even why, be in the same universe. Yeah, and the reason why the short term may show similar results or maybe interval training might be better in, in, in a month is because building muscle is a slow process. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. So, um, you know, building muscle takes time, but once you start to build that muscle, it's like compounding. The, the results co become compounding. So, uh, this is the argument I made in the resistance training revolution. And there's lots, I have lots of studies in there to that point to this and why this is the form of exercise that we're going to see this in the next 10 years. It is going to be the first form of exercise that we recommend to people um, because of its effects on metabolic health and because you don't need to do a lot of it. You know, two days a week of building a muscle will give you better results than seven days a week of other forms of exercise. Well, and that may be a little misleading and confusing for people because they see that initial like calorie burn is m much more substantial yes. in, the, in the hit uh, category in That's the why. circuit training. And mm -hmm. so they'll see that and, and associate that, you know, with, with a better metabolism and, and fat burning uh, type of a method when in fact, you know, the long term, uh, just the resistance Your training. body adapts to that form of exercise yeah. very quickly. Very quickly. Uh, the adaptation with strength training from a metabolic health standpoint is the opposite. It doesn't adapt to become less effective. It actually becomes more effective over time. So this is what makes it so incredible. And again, the time spent needing to gain these benefits isn't much. Two days a week, and you'll see significant improvements if it's done properly. You'll see significant improvements in metabolic health. Other forms of exercise two days a week won't show nearly as much. And by the way, I mean, this is one of those things that always gets clipped of our content and then somebody will try. And <laughs> it's like, no one here is saying that you should never do no. the other one. It's like, there's value. They all have value. Yes. Yeah, they, yeah. It's like- the, Different the, tools. The truth is like, why Why would you only do one or, and not the other? It's like, but if you know, if we're going to get asked a very specific question, well, there's your answer. It's 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 not, even, I, to me, it's not even a close call, but I would never just ignore- the benefits of hit and not finding ways to implement that into your training regimen. So I think it should be heavily focused on resistance strength training as the, as the foundation of it. And then you, you know, interrupt that with these bouts of, of hit, and then you get the best of both worlds. Yep. Next question is from despise Valentine's day. <laughs> That's a funny that's, one. That's Adam. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the different body types, mesomorph, endomorph, ectomorph? If you do believe in those different body types, how would you train and eat for each? It's been a while. This is over. Oh, so these are somatotypes. Let me explain what they are with the classic somatotypes, these ones that they define, what they're supposed to look like. So mesomorph would be your classic muscle building athlete, medium height, broad shoulders, strong bones, uh, long muscle bellies, mesomorph or excuse me, endomorph is, uh, overweight, big stores bone. more body fat, big yeah. bone, thick waist tends to be tall, uh, taller. The ectomorph is tall, thin, narrow shoulders, doesn't gain weight very easily. And this was actually created by a, I think a zoologist, uh, way back in the day. It's great marketing, oh, super yeah. oversimplified. In fact, when they originally did this, they attached personality types to each one. <laughs> that that endomorphs or overweight oh, really? people were jolly and happy. You know, really, they yeah. did that. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, it's all. So I okay, this I, is all, it's it's so oversimplified. And, okay, it's oversimplified, but I still like it. Okay, and I used I used it as a trainer a lot to get just for the visual. Yeah, and so and I actually like to use like athletes. So I like to show like three different like athlete types. Like you have your your running back would be like your your mesomorph, right? So your running back, but cornerback is your no, the, the, not all football. I would use different. Then your your marathon runner would be like your or swimmer would be like your endomorph, and then your ecto or excuse me ectomorph, and then your endomorph would be like a sumo wrestler, right? That would be sure. like these extreme examples of the athletes. Now. What you find with these types of people, uh, they have similar, like they, the like all endomorphs. If you were to fall in that endomorph category, have similar kind of eating habits. They don't eat as they keep getting endomorph and ectomorph. Sorry, it's been so long since so I've used some nanotypes. Uh, if you're an ectomorph, you tend people would say, oh, you have this faster metabolism. You're longer, you're leaner. Well, a lot of what we find is that a lot of these people are fidgety. They don't eat as much, and yeah. so you know, and those are the factors that make more of a difference than this the skeletal body type. But for get for explaining to people the differences and the strengths that these people have, like somebody who is the ectomorph type of body type may 
classify themselves as a hard gainer, but look at a treadmill and lose body fat. And so I would use that as examples of the challenges that they have with building muscle, learning, losing body fat. It reminds me of like when we talk about 3,500 calories equals one pound of fat. It's another oversimplification of the process. But an of, effective way to communicate. But an effective way to communicate to the average client body types yeah. and differences and what, what a, a it's, calorie. It's definitely oversimplified. I think the reason why when you look at high level athletes, this looks obvious is because high level athletes are already ultra filtered and biased into these categories. The top of the top marathon runners are going to look a particular way. The top of the top sumo wrestlers are going to look a particular way. The top of the top running backs are going to look a particular way. Now, the average person doesn't fall into this category. In fact, there's a lot of big boned ectomorphs. They have big bones, but they just can't, they just don't gain a lot of weight. There's also a lot of tall, narrow shouldered mesomorphs. They build a lot of muscle. Like it doesn't, they don't all go hand in hand. Yeah. They're overgeneralizations, but they mm. can be effective ways of communicating. And the question is, you know, if you believe in those body types, how would you train and eat for each? I wouldn't. Would I would ask no. questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's all going to be based off of their lifestyle, their behaviors, what works, what doesn't work for them. Not this category of you know every people fall in this category of you know ecto, endo, or meso. Well, this is just again, this is human psychology. We're always trying to kind of categorize things in, in neat boxes and like try to you know if I see this, this is what I can expect and predict in this situation and. Um, you know, we're always trying to find something that's a little more relatable to our very specific situation. Um, and you know, sometimes it does work. And so it's like, you know, you might find somebody that's about your size, your build, you know, and you look at their eating habits and you look at their training habits and you try to sort of associate that with you. And then when you get through that, a lot of times you're going to find out it, it, it literally has nothing to do. Like, it's just, there's something off with that formula. It's just not working for you individually because there's a different individual need you have, uh, but you have to be able to kind of parse your way through that. Uh, so I just, I think this is just kind of playing into that, that human psychology totally. and, and they're able to market that. So it's like, it, you kind of take it for a way to maybe start fine tuning that down a little closer to maybe something that relates. But th from there, you really have to get even more nuanced and, and tighten more of we, those screws. For to get, to 100%. Get I mean, I feel like the way I use this is one, either trying to communicate and explain it to a client to get an idea of like, oh, you know, that client has challenges with losing body yeah. fat. They have a better chance. They they do a good, they have a good job. Uh, it's a building great way muscle. to connect with them. Right. So it's yeah. easy that it also helped me as a coach trainer. If someone walked in the door and they looked like this body, like one of these body types, right? For like, they, they stood like they were the extreme example of it, an endomorph or an ectomorph walked in. I could assume some things probably already about them. And I, more often than not, like 90 plus percent of the time, I'd probably be right. If a t real tall, lanky, skinny kid walks in that looks like a for sure ectomorph, yeah, yeah. I bet he has a hard time building muscle. I bet he has a hard time. In now, why does he? could totally be a total change. Lifestyle. Yeah. 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 It, I, then I start diving into his diet and I go like, well, of course he eats 40 grams of protein every yeah. day and he's playing basketball six times a week. And it's like <laughs> less to do with his skeletal structure and more to do with his behaviors and habits. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really what matters is like, okay, so it gives me a clue. I can look at a skeletal type, right? And see someone's body and go, this gives me clues into some of the struggles they have, what exactly those struggles are and why they're having them. That's what you have to dive into. What I into. find interesting yeah, about, investigate. about stuff like this is we've been trying to do this for a long time and some of it still exists. Like there was a period of time when phrenology was a science. You know what that is? Phrenology? They, phrenology. They read the bumps in your skull and they can tell things about your personality, oh, your trip. behaviors. There's... To, there still are are people that look at face structures, people with uh, long faces, blood wide type faces. diets. We've talked about, yeah, yeah. So we love this. We love yeah. this stuff because we like to be like identified with, like, oh yeah, that's. I've seen like they're like clickbaity that's things on so Facebook. Me. You ever seen these things on Facebook where like, what kind of feet do you have? And it's like Roman, Egyptian, Mediterranean, <laughs> whatever. What does it say about your personality? They Sloth. get so many clicks. I'm like, oh no, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Velociraptor. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Next question is. From All In 3, what are the essentials for home gyms and what squat rack is best? I, if you own a home, if you want to have a home gym, there's a lot of fancy equipment out there. There's a lot of stuff you could buy. Literally, literally, this is all you need. A rack, a barbell, adjustable dumbbells, and adjustable bench, you're done. 
You can do almost anything and everything with, with that. that. In fact, I trained people with that for years and years and years. You want to add something else in there, you can add a, a cable machine, but not even necessary. I mean, that's what mine at home looks like, right? Yeah. I don't have the adjustable dumbbells. I have just up to 50 pound dumbbells, which is still doesn't feel like it's enough, but it's enough for what I need to do right yeah. now. Like that's the funny part about that is like you assume that you God, I had like I was I mean, trained yesterday in here and I was using the 80s. But it's like, I don't need that every single day inside my home gym. And so I think what you just said is is plenty. And the best, I, PRX is the ill nana. Like that, I... Because all the attachments. I mean, they figured out so many different angles of how to, like, add things that you didn't think they'd be able to figure it out. And so now you got all these attachments. You can do cables now. You can do uh, reverse hyper. You can do, like, it's just, it's crazy. But if you just start with the base of that. Yeah, but here's here's what I really like about... PRX. I am a huge uh, home gym rack junkie. I've always been because I've always worked out in home gyms. And it, there used to be a big problem with getting a stable, sturdy rack for your house. You had the commercial ones in the yeah, gym. It was super wonky back then. Oh, man. You you load over 200 pounds on a, on yeah, a home. All wobbly. Yeah, and it's wobbling and dangerous. And I've seen videos. These I, their, their rack is more stable than your commercial it's gym It's the racks. most stable rack I've ever yeah. used because it attaches to the wall. So it's literally anchored in the wall and and then you, you, you know, it folds into the wall so it's it only comes off the wall six inches. You pull it off, then the, the, the legs hit the floor. It's stabilized by the wall. It's the, of all the commercial racks, it's yeah. the most stable rack you yeah. could possibly use. No. So that's, that's and my And it tucks thing. away, so you pull your cars in there still. I mean, yeah. what they did was yeah. was brilliant. I mean, this is, wasn't intended to be this It's not massive. hard to revolutionize. I mean, it's hard to revolutionize strength training because there's lots of equipment that comes out and it yeah. can't replace free weights. They did it with the rack. I'll racks. throw one in that's not a sponsor. It's, I mean, the torque sled for me, it was like yeah. amazing. Only because it's like... Okay, like you you got tires. You don't need weights. Like it has its own kind of magnetic resistance, so it's like you're pushing it, and it it is so challenging. But it's like you can do it anywhere. It's not you're not gonna scuff up all your driveway and all that stuff. Where I used to like just push the sled. I know you did that. <laughs> My neighbor's like apartment yeah. <laughs> sparks. I yeah. Just, yeah. just just leaving marks everywhere. Five o'clock yeah. in the morning. Yeah. Who just, is this asshole, yeah, dude? That, oh this guy. God. I would yeah. so fight you. But I mean, yeah, good. like at this point, I've done so many backloaded squats. I need like another stimulus and like I just need that sled. Yeah. It helps so much for my legs. Now, one yeah. step down would be an adjustable bench and uh, adjustable dumbbells. And for the average person, you could do a lot with this. And this was my everyday average client. Yeah. This is what I would have them get. And then if they want to take it a step further, then we'd add the rack and the barbells and then we were done. You, good, could, yeah. you could go infinitely with that, uh, you know, with, with progress. Look, if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our guides. We have fitness guides that can help you with fat loss, muscle building, health, vitality, wellness, almost any fitness goal. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. We can find us on Instagram. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm on Instagram at mindpumpdestefano. And Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 